and good morning viewers or good afternoon or good evening depending on where we're beaming into your offices or lounge room because it is a global show. Welcome to Inspire Talk Game Changes on radio. I am driving it today. I'm Wendy from Elgin Hall, CEO and founder of a business school with a finishing school philosophy for modern executives. And my co-host today is the fantastic Stuart. Stuart is a thought leader and a peak performance success coach and also a bit of a marketing guru. We're very excited to have a de uh, desk. Yes, we're very excited to have a desk, but we're also <laughs> very excited to have a fantastic guest this morning, cannot wait to pull out the themes between sport and business. Thought I would set the scene today and if you haven't already guessed what type of sporting background he's come from, this might help a little bit more. Plus I've got um, some flags and I thought that I wouldn't just be exclusive to this particular AFL genre. So I've got a Melbourne Storm flag up too, or, or scarf. So we've introduced a little bit of league in there and um, you never know what else might pop up. A few soccer balls might um, be bounced across the background. Who knows? So stay tuned. So I'm going to introduce our, de our what is it about desks this morning, our guest. And our guest has done so much that I couldn't memorise it, so I've had to write it down. That's a couple of pages worth. So very excited to have Simon Madden with us this morning, this afternoon or this evening. His achievements are too numerous to mention but I'm going to mention them anyway. 15 years teaching including in a vice principal role and that is no mean feat being an ex-primary school teacher my, uh, myself. I know that that's absolutely no mean feat. 14 years in IT, media, marketing industries, that's no mean feat either. CEO and founder of Winning, a successful people capability consulting practice, fantastic, sought after peak performance speaker and because that wasn't quite enough for Simon, Simon also played 378 games of AFL football for Essendon for those that might live in some obscure place in Alaska, AFL stands for Australian Football League, great game. He um, was named captain of the club, Essendon Football Club, very iconic football club, very successful football club in a, based in Victoria but clearly Australian, black and red colours and um, just trying to think of the logo but the, the uh, wow. uh, mascot, oh yeah that's it, that's it. Um, named captain of the club, played in two premiership teams and selected for um, all Australian teams on numerous occasions. Involvement in the Players Association, um, including time as president, and that's a really important um, association to have and still is. Director of the board of the Essendon Football Club, another extremely pivotal and important role. Um, and the, he's absolutely and typifies the essence of sustainability because he's one of the longest serving football players and has one of the longest serving careers in the AFL and VFL history. So combining all this experience with a philosophy and approach and skills and capability in improving people and improving businesses, we're very excited to have him here and you can see why we've asked him, tapped him on the shoulder to be our guest today. So we might, or we're not might, we will, we'll get the ball rolling and, and um, get some questions happening here which we've thought about, which is always good. So the first question, Simon, oh, so, no, sorry, let me just welcome you first. Simon, over to you. Welcome, before we put you in the hot seat and start firing questions at you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Wendy. It's uh, good to be here. Um, it's uh, great to be part of a modern technology and modern broadcasting appeal. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing how years ago the only way you could do this would be with a huge camera, a huge microphone in front of you and, and wait for that to be broadcast slowly out across the world and now you can uh, do it in front of your own computer anywhere in the world, so it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Alrighty, so uh, let's get the ball rolling. Um, my, I'm going to um, start the first question. We know you are a legend um, yourself, Simon, <laughs> but if you could uh, meet a legend, alive or dead, who would that be? Um, yeah, very good question. I think, I think from sporting, from the sporting background, I think it'd have to be Muhammad Ali. I think someone yep. who did what he did, the way he did it, uh, with the the dedication, the, the humour and the outlook that he had. I think that I think that would be very, very good. 
and I also think that um, uh, if there's someone living, I think uh, uh, the the leader, uh, the president of the United, the present president of the United States, I think would be very interesting to talk to at the moment about how supposedly the um, the, the most powerful country in the world, uh, how he sees. America and the world in the future. I think that would be fascinating as well. So, uh, if I could have two, I'll pick uh, those two. Um, okay. And yep. So, uh, but uh, maybe, maybe the president first because he's alive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. That's really interesting. That's great. Um, Stuart, over to you. Yeah. So, look, very interesting to hear hear you say that, Simon, because I've always been very intrigued by the the U.S. president as well. So, be very keen to to get involved with um, an interview with him. And uh, of course, you know, everybody is moulded by the influences they have in their lives. Um, and to a large degree, um, some of those stick with us uh, and we carry them right through for the whole of our lives. Uh, who would be the person that's given you the biggest piece of wisdom in your life and what was it? Oh, look, that's a great, great question. Uh, look, there's been a number of people, I think. Um well, my mother was a very big influence. Um, no, it's nothing about football. Still, the, no, it was passed away, but towards the end of her life, still knew nothing about football. But my father died when I was 13, and we had three big boys, an older brother and a younger. I was the middle one. I'm the diplomat in between. And uh, I think br br raising three teenage boys up to be, uh, well, hopefully good adults uh, on her own, and while uh, I started playing league football and later on Justin, the younger one, started playing league football too. I started very, I started at 16. So be able to... Uh, keep a family together, have a son who's two sons playing league football and uh, uh, do a very good job in, in a whole lot of other issues. Very, very good. And I think on top of that, I think all the coaches I had along the way would have been um, uh, male role models for me, so I would have had people who uh, who really influenced me in, in a whole lot of ways. So I think initially those those sets of people are the ones who uh, probably shaped my life. Mm, okay. that's Yeah, they say, well, they often say behind every successful man is a, successful woman and I'd say yeah nine times out of ten it's the mothers well certainly if the father's around as well but there's also isn't it interesting there's also something about people children who lose a parent early they're often the high achievers and I don't really and I, I don't know if we really know what that's about but there must be something in there about resilience or don't know don't know it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one I think sometimes too is because um uh, and look, I'm not an expert on this, but because you do lose a parent, then all of a sudden there's more responsibility on you at an earlier age. So you actually have to make decisions by yourself. And sometimes you make poor decisions because you're not being you're not, you're not being guided the correct way. But you learn from learn from those decisions. So I think uh, what can happen is that you have to you have to take responsibility for your own life more earlier than a lot of other people do. Probably right, actually. And and Simon, you and I have had that um, conversation around how I had a similar background. I lost my dad also really early, and my mum had to step up to the mark and be both mum and dad. And she'd be out there mowing the lawns and uh, you know taking on the role of the male. We know you don't mow lawns because your dad passed away after mowing the lawn. <laughs> that's that's, that's another that's story. That's another story. <laughs> um, and so I've got to say, for me, I never had, the, I'd never felt there was a glass ceiling. I never, and I always, interestingly, in my background, worked in a lot of male-oriented organisations. You know, the transport industry and so on. So I, it, it, I don't know. It must have just changed the way I looked at the world. I didn't see females. I saw females as being right there next to males. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to explore that a little bit more, or perhaps with someone else. Well, even with you another time, but. Yeah, really pull out that theme and look at that because there's, there's, yeah, there's something juicy in there. There's a story in there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, so I'd like to really now connect, because this is what excites me the most, the lessons from elite sport to business because certainly that's why we're here on the radio show. It's about inspiring and giving business owners, entrepreneurs, people working in uh, corporates or not-for-profits. So it's about what are the lessons. So here we go with the lessons today. The theme is our sporting lessons, what business can learn from elite sport. What are your thoughts, Simon, around the comment that when compared to sport, businesses don't spend enough time recruiting properly, they don't spend enough time on selection uh, or getting the right people on the team in the first place? Thoughts around that? Look, it's, it's a really, it's a again. You've you've done your you've done your uh, questioning and homework very well. I think that's a really important part part because you find historically 
with businesses, what they will do, they will uh, hire, hire for skill, but in the end they fire for fit. And what, and what that means is simply, and, and I've seen the examples of this um, a, a number of times, when they're looking for a set of skills and they're prepared to get a person with those set of skills, but they haven't really, um, some, some companies do these days, they put a whole lot of work into selection, but they go into deep and say, look, skills can be taught, you can actually educate people because they would have had educated these skills, get these uh, skills, been educated on these skills along the way, but how do they fit into your organisation? And that's that's more and more that's important in any organisation. And in sports teams, I don't know when the uh, in the team I'm involved with, the Essendon and the AFL, there's a whole lot of process goes into. Even though there's someone who might be a great sports person, there's a whole lot of work that goes into what's the person behind the sports person. How will they fit into our culture? How will they fit into our organisation? How will and in a in a in an industry where you need a lot of ego to succeed in, in sport. How do you, how do you uh, fit in with everybody else, and um, that's really really important. And more and more, that's becoming important. I think in our society, uh, we talk about teamwork. The fancy term now is uh, collaboration, but it's still the same thing. We are we're taught to be independent, and it's very important to be independent. But I think um, uh, over overall, the world works on interdependency. That we can't get we can't get done what we need to get done unless we're working with other people and collaborating with other people. And that's other organisations, that's other departments in our in our organisation, that's other people in our department, etc. So once we understand that success comes from interdependence and working with each other and collaborating and then understanding that your people have to fit in with that and they have to understand that they have to fit in with that, uh, then you can be more successful. Yeah, totally agree, uh, Simon. Uh, you know, I, I see it all the time. Actually, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of larger companies, in, in particular, uh, they're, they're recruiting people based around a certain criterion for the role, but they're not really looking at that criterion in terms of how it fits into the organisational culture or um, how it's going to be applied to a particular project or a role. And um, you know, a, a lot of issues come from that. You, you can see a lot of demotivated people because they think that they're here for a specific process, but in actual fact, that process has been really quite modified by what's going on in, inside the business. Um, so, so my question would be, you know, given some of those circumstances, and, and it's quite prevalent as, as we know, um, how, how would you use the lessons from sport to to create the right motivational environment for um, some of these these entities. Um, again, a good question. It's um, uh, it, it's about culture, and people people don't understand culture. People think culture is, and it, it there is directed from a top from the top, but culture comes from everybody. And I think you've got to understand it's very clear that everything you do, so in, in any organisation, everything you do uh, adds to continues or detracts from the culture you want and, and everybody everybody does that and, and if, if you say one thing and do another so you say we say we, you say we want this culture but do you do something else then it doesn't work and sports teams were especially you know especially high level t sports teams again full of lots of egos as I said they have to work really really hard on a culture where everybody holds each other accountable to the level they want to the culture they want and again, it's directed from the top, and, and that's when you talk about the leaders that connects. It's very hard, very hard to talk about leadership in isolation because I have to talk about the individual, the team, um, uh, the culture, and the leadership uh, as linked together because that's how it works in an organisation. But you've, you've really, you've really got to make sure that everybody is holding each other accountable to what they agree to do. And that's and that's very easily said and very, very hard to do because people say, "Yes, I will do that." But, or well, people say, yes, everybody else will do that, but not me, because I'm the most important person in the organisation. And once you understand, and it's a very scary word for a lot of people, and there's a word that is, uh, that, um, is not used a lot these days, but sacrifice. If you can sacrifice something for the greater good, and, and that's, uh, that's a whole lot of things. That doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big sacrifice. That might be as simple as holding your tongue in a conversation when you want to shout somebody down, or... or or quickly interrupting into someone's conversation when what you really should be doing is listening to them. Just making small sacrifices for the greater good, from that right through to bigger sacrifices, is really really important in, in, in developing a culture. And and, in, and part of that too is developing a culture is what your leaders do and how your leaders can help direct that culture in the right direction. Yeah, 
Mm, interesting. Yeah, so it's not unlike the armed forces, is it, where it's the greater good. It's about keeping the world safe or keeping our country safe and it's directed from the leaders. And it's interesting too with elite sport around it is so important for your culture to get it right because you are in a bit of a goldfish bowl and everything that that culture does is seen. So it has to be on culture, on brand. Um, but it, uh, it, I also wonder whether culture radiates out and impacts the viewers or the fans so they get embraced in the culture and they become a part of the culture as well. Do you have any thoughts on that, Simon? This has gone off the, the typical um, questions, but, but well, um, I'd like, be interested in thoughts around that as well. No, look, it is because uh, and you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful with the use of you know when people talk about branding, it can sound very corporate and it can sound very shallow. And, and you and you want to talk about oh, we've got this brand, surface brand that looks good out there. Um, we're past that. A lot of people in the world now are past that. Um, I, I I have four adult children and I see how they interact with the world and I have to see how their friends interact with the world. And there's got to be a lot more depth to it or they just don't take it on. Mm -hmm. And what you find, and I, and I know as a director of the Essendon Football Club, is that we've gone through, uh, for those who don't know, we've gone through a fairly uh, hard uh, last three years because of um, uh, uh, Asada and Wada, which is uh, uh, um, the, the bodies, the peak bodies looking after uh, the drug regulation and we had, we had issues there with that. So we've got to a stage where we've really had to analyse what our culture is and what it means to us, what it means to the players, what it means to um, the supporters, the followers, the people involved in the club. And you really do have to look at, the, at, at to a, a, a greater depth on how you want to connect with those people. Because if you're talking about sport, and it's also it's safe sport, your, your shareholders, your members, or your followers, any business, the key stakeholders, if they're not engaged with that business, and that can be the shareholders, or it can be your workers, or it can be your clients, if they're not connected properly with that business, they're not engaged with that business, and they're not really part of your culture, or understand your culture, or connect with your culture, you can lose them easily. So you really have to work on making sure that you are very clear about your culture. And I work on four things. When I work with organisation, work with people, I work on clarity, direction, cooperation, and challenge. Really, really clear about where you stand and what you believe in. Uh, uh, make sure you know what your direction is, and that, again, that's clear, but you, uh, I can see what your direction is. You look at all the challenges that you have to face, and then you have to work on the cooperation needed from all the levels, all the stakeholders, to get to where you want to go. Now, that, that's a model that I believe in. It's a model I understand. I know there's lots of other models out there, but for me, that makes real sense. And, and, I, know, and I know with sporting groups that they have to work on that. They have to be really clear about what they are, what they are and what they do. And, that, and that's for in business, they have to be really clear and you have to be able to communicate that out and you have to know what your direction is so you're heading, you know, you're heading there. If, 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 uh, if you don't know where you're going well, you know, everywhere you go is fine because it's just where, you, you know, where you're heading. Yeah. So you've got to be real and more and more in the modern world, more and more in the modern world, it's becoming um, more important. And I think, uh, and again a philosophy I had is that one of the great things about the modern world is that uh, there are so many choices. One of the problems with the modern world is there's so many choices. And, and what you have to do with your group, your organisation, your clients, your, uh, your customers is understand how you can help them narrow their choices down to get the solutions and outcomes that they want. And and, and um, rather than and it's not products or services, it's solutions and outcomes that they want. And if you can do that and, and you do it really well, and so you can ex you can explain to them what you do, you can show them what you do, then you actually do it, and they like it. Um, it's very hard for them not to keep connected with you. Mm -hmm. So some great words in there, clarity, direction, simplicity, really powerful and I really like that comment around um, choices. The, the great thing about the world is that there are great choices and the negative thing about the world is that there are too many choices, that there are you know, numerous choices. It's like it's, harder, it's, it's easier than ever to stand up and it's harder than ever to stand out. So you're spot on around simplifying it, make it e making it easy for them and really communicating that um, you can be another solution and that was another powerful word as well, communication. Yeah, look, it's, it's um, you see, you know, with, again, well, we're using modern technology. With modern technology, everybody needs to tell a story in under 25 words or less. And so you, you know, it's, it's got to be a Twitter, it's got to be a Twitter feed, or it's got to be a, a Facebook post. It's got to be quick. It's got to be snappy. And so sometimes we do actually get this this glossy veneer rather than getting the depth in it. And you've got to make sure that with your people, the communication is really clear, precise, uh, and and it's regular and it's standard and it, and it's continuous. 
but it's got to have depth to it as well. A lot of a lot of time, a lot of our communication is just very, very. I think the word is naff, if I can use it. I think that's the right word. That it's just very shallow. And if you really want to connect with your the, and what, whatever organisation you're in, whether you're a, a a big corporate, a small business, a sporting organisation, a not for not for profit, a charity, you've got to be really You've got your mate. You've got your mate there. <laughs> It's interesting. Interesting. You're wearing the bulldogs. Uh, you're wearing the bulldogs um, the jumper, and he's jumped in with you. So it, it's um, uh, just making sure that that, that communication really connects with your people, and it's really, 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 really clear for them. Sorry about the bulldogs in the background. They're actually right. not bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> It's work-life alignment, isn't it? Work-life alignment, not work-life balance, work-life alignment. We love it, we love it. We roll with the punches and it's about authenticity in today's world and it's not unlike what you just said about um, narrow or depth. It's also about being authentic. So, Stuart, I'm going to put my microphone off and deal with these dogs. You can ask the next question. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, interesting, the, um, the the bulldog coming together there on, on the screen. So. Um, Look, um, Simon, uh, really intrigued by what you've been talking about there, um, particularly in terms of um, you know guidance, communication, direction, and the likes. And, and if, if if you were to look at um, you know probably a prime example of somebody succeeding around this, if we if we look at how the Wallabies are going right now, and Michael Chica and what what he's been able to do with that team and transform them into essentially a World Cup winning team. I mean, they're, they're capable of taking right. out that competition. And uh, so, so, so my question probably is, you know, what, what are the things that Michael's been doing with that organisation, for want of a better term, um, and how can we, how can we uh, compare that with uh, an application in a business sense? Yeah, no, look, look, yeah, good. Um, I, I think more and more, uh, De definitely. Look, you, you, you look at say rugby side. I mean, in, in my team, it's uh, it's AFL football. But any any contact sport, the coach says or the manager says, put your head over the ball then and get it knocked off, and then put your head over the ball again and get it knocked off again, and then put your head over the ball again and get it knocked off. Now, after a while, it doesn't matter how much money you're getting paid, you might not want to do that. You might. I don't really want to put my head over the ball again, right? And so the idea is, what is the vision? What is the vision that he has? That has got them together because there's got to be something that they all link into and understand and agree to. So there's got to be buying. So if the vision is really, really clear, um, that's that's a really big starting point. Why are we doing this? The why is becoming more and more important. Then he's got to be really good at communicating that, really, really communicating that. And more and more now, um, and there's a whole lot of studies in this about positive psychology. And there's for, for some people the idea of positive psychology is a nice little rub on the shoulder and everything will be okay. That's not the way it is. Positive psychology is really analysing what you do well, looking at your strengths, and really being positive about that. And then, and people say that's all you do. No, then you look at where you can improve. Some people like to say weaknesses, that's fine. But you look at them, and then you have a positive approach of how you improve that. So in both areas, you're not being positive and negative. You say, right, yes, we are positive. These are your strengths. And we'll keep working on these. Uh, we look at these. We can see these are, aren't strengths, so we're going to be positive about how we improve them. That's really important. But the why now is becoming more important. Important with uh, the, the well the younger and for me I'm you know over 50 so anybody under 50 is young but the younger people in the workforce if you say to them if you say to them do this and they go why and you say because I say so um, historically they would have gone oh, okay now if you say that what why they say why and you say I say so they can clearly calm in there and say well I won't because I say so because you're on a, you're on even ground. And this is because we've educated our kids, and educated kids will ask questions. So if you don't know how to handle that, then you're in trouble. But if you say to them, you know, do this and they go, why? And you say, well, for you this, for me this, for your organisation this, and the greater good, and they believe you, and they get the why, they'll do it better. So that's a long answer to a short question. But when, when the coach or the manager of a sports team says, I'm going to send you out there on the ground to get hurt, and maybe hurt people as well, and they say, why, you know, why... Um, why am I going to do this? He can have come across with the vision says we do this, this, and we end up being. And it's a bit easy to be motivated when you say you can be uh, the world champion in this sport. That's a great motivation. You can talk about the vision and the course of plan that goes with that. 
But if you can really give them that clear vision and then the plan that goes with it, um, uh, you've got a really good chance of succeeding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and look, um, you know, really it, it forms one of those key principles of, of um, you know, success, I guess, is, is for want of the right word. Uh, you, you know, you're talking about the why, which is internalising something that says, I really want to do this because I have uh, inner desire to achieve something. And then, then you've got the other one, which you mentioned earlier on, is having that uh, stakeholder engagement, which I think Michael Chicka does very well as well. And I know, Wendy, you, you, you've you got a little bit of a question around principles, and I'll pass back to you for that. Yeah, so um, I'd like to talk about competition. They always say in business, in order to be successful, it's important to study your competition. And, of course, you do that in football. You run onto the football field every weekend or on public holidays, and you're able to suss out the competition, and then you can learn from that. But as business people and people working in organisations, we can't run onto the football field every weekend and suss out our competition. So how how do we do it? What's what? suggestions and ideas do you have around that, Simon? No, it's, I, I think you do have to look at your position and you do have to look at your marketplace. So if, you, if, you're, look, if, if you're just looking at what you're doing and what your clients are doing and your, or your, your customers, and there's a difference between those two, but um, if that's all you're doing, that's good, but somebody might be going right past you. And, and if, you're, if you're standing still, you might as well be walking backwards because if you're standing still, Someone's got more momentum; they're going to go past you. So you've got to look at what the marketplace is, and in, in any industry you're in, and in, in the sporting industry, you always got to keep looking at that. You're you're going to look at what the changes are, what technical changes in, in a whole lot of areas. You've got to keep up with that. Then you've got to, wherever you can, look at the opposition and find out what they're doing well, what you can re re replicate, and what they're not doing well, and which you can take advantage of. And and they're, in the modern world. You can go and look at their website. You can go and look at brochures. You can go and talk to people. Now you don't have to spend a lot of time on doing that. But one of the, you know, one of the really big things about um, uh, uh, sporting, uh, sporting groups, sporting clubs, sporting organisations is that they do, re uh, they do rigorous and continual review. And on a Monday morning after after a weekend, and most most sport, although it can be any time these days, most sports are done on a weekend. The first thing they do on Monday morning is review. What do we do right? What do we do wrong? What can we tweak? What do we have to change? In business, the first thing you do on Monday morning is go into business. And so we have to build mm -hmm. it. And might not have to be as it might might not have to be as rigorous as say sports clubs do because there's training, 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 and then there's the actual game. We're in business. Business is going on all the time. But we have to build in a review. And if you're just saying, "Oh, we have an annual review," then you're probably not reviewing enough. And that doesn't mean you have to spend hours on it. If you're just, you know, it's if you're just spending that little bit of time to saying, "How does this? How's the next three months looking? What have we done?" And this is a really important thing. So we can be very, very, we can be negative very quickly. We're very quick to say, "What are we doing wrong?" And that's right. If you look at what can, you can change there, but you need to look at what are we doing right. If you can, if you can understand what we're doing right. Actually, understand what we're doing right. Understand what we're doing right. Then we can replicate it. We can actually we can actually do it again and repeat it and repeat it. So I think that's really important about that and, and having a look at it that way. Yeah, that's great. I'm just going to talk over top of the dogs, <laughs> <laughs> the doggies, the bulldogs. Um, that little tip around yeah, every Monday morning rather than the annual review. Every Monday morning, what do we keep? What do we flip? What do we tweak? That's amazing. You and I had that conversation, yeah. and it, it was almost like a no-brainer. It's like, oh my god, why why aren't we all doing this? And I started doing that in my own business, and it's amazing. So instead of just rewriting my to-do list and thinking about um, stuff like you would normally get through the normal productivity strategies. I did that and that I've got to recommend that to everybody watching this today. It is extremely powerful. So a really great thing in, yes, we can learn from elite sport and go away and learn from elite sport. Hang it over to Stuart. Uh, the challenge of being on the challenges of being online. So um, thanks, Wendy. So, uh, Simon, I'm really keen to find out a little bit about a little bit more about yourself um, and and your own success story to date. Uh, Richard Branson, obviously, um, very prominent uh, person and well known for all of us. He talks about success being um, a bit of hard work, a bit of luck, and a bit of adventure. So, what 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 sort of adventures have you been on, and which ones gave you the most success? No, look, that's. Uh... 
<laughs> Good. I think I think I think there's there's um it's it's based on hard work. It has to be hard work. Uh, anybody who says it's not hard work doesn't understand it. I'm really big on on uh, on a uh, philosophy. That if you don't understand the struggle, you never understand the success. A lot of people want the success uh, quickly, and every now and then you'll hear the story about some you know those they get rich quick schemes. Or, oh, I did this and I'm rich now. Every now and then something works. So there's some great there's some great technical people out there who've come up with the right app at the right time and made lots of money. But for every one of them, there's hundreds and thousands of people who tried to make an app and it didn't work and they haven't made their, uh, haven't made their money. So it's really about, it is about hard work, but it's also about smart work. Now that's that old story. If you keep doing the same, if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results, well that's called madness. So it's about smart work. I'm really, I'm really big on, on um, taking risks, but it's got to be calculated risks. I think sometimes people just, uh, you know, it's like saying, well, you go and put all your money on, you know, uh, 27 black on the roulette. Uh, that's a risk, but it's far too big a risk. You know, far too big a risk for me. But uh, I, I think it's really important that you understand about you're going to make mistakes, and, and it's uh, you get, everybody gets knocked down. And I know in the sport of football I played, it was um, you got knocked down physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, 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 and um, uh, mentally. And I, and I say spiritually, and people that's in a very broad sense, but you actually get physically hurt. It actually gets a stage where you begin to say, "What the hell am I doing?" And then it actually it actually challenged what you really believed about yourself and how you could handle yourself in the game. So you're going to get challenged and you'll get knocked down, but really good people get up. And I'm sure if you spoke to Richard Branson, he'd be saying, "Well, it doesn't always work. I've made some mistakes, but you learn from the mistakes. You get up, um, dust yourself off, and keep going." And I think that's really important. Hard work, smart work, um, getting up when you get knocked down, and of course that review process. How can I improve? It, it's about if, if, it's about continual improvement. Then it's about continual review. What can we do well? How can we improve it? What do I need to tweak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think those things are really, really important for anybody in any in any um, any way, shape, or form in any organisation where you want to improve. And it goes back to what we just saying before. That process of review is stop, start, keep, change. What do I stop? What do I start? What do I keep? What do I change? And that's something where. And you've got to be, um, you've got to sit the emotion away. You, you, it's very hard to do. It's easy to say hard to do. Sit the emotion away for a, a moment because if it's your organisation or your company or it's really important to, sometimes you have this emotional connection to it which interferes with how we're making cool, clear, calm decisions. You set the emotion aside for a moment. You go through that analysis. Then you put the emotion back in and say, how does that fit in with it? Um, I think that's important for everybody in any organisation. That's really good too, actually. So it is about continuous improvement and some tools and things around that stop, start, exact, um, et cetera. But you're right, because if we come from it with the emotion still in there, we're not going to get the right answers. But if we can put the emotion aside, but then bring it back, because you need to bring it back at some point, that's, yeah, I really like that. That's really useful as well. So another powerful sentence, continuous improvement, and then tools and things around that, taking the emotion out, putting the emotion back in again. So uh, we could stand here or sit here and ask questions for hours because you're so interesting and so the topic is interesting too, pulling together elite sport lessons for business. But we, we do need to start winding up. So we've got two more questions just to wind up. I'll ask okay. the first one and then Stuart can ask the last one. What's left for Simon Madden? What, what else is out there for Simon uh -huh. Madden? So there's, there's, there's lots out there to do. I still have to um, I still have to learn to play sharp dress man on the guitar. I still have to work on my. I'm still uh, I, I I play I, just a little off. So I'm playing a rock and roll band as a, a side piece. So we're still continually working on that. Uh, I I learned French years ago and then I've forgotten it all. So I'm in the process of learning some more French just because it's good for your brain. Uh, and uh, and I'm uh, I'm thinking about learning the harmonica. So that's those things uh, away from the that's the work life balance. In uh, in in my work, I just want to keep meeting with people and and with organisation, help them understand how they can have a continuous improvement. And and it's and that's that's one of the things people don't understand because it's it's one thing to be successful, and it's another thing to stay successful. And that's that. I'm, it's an ongoing process. And um, you know, as I say, you can get the you get the big. The, the the big statement where you know life's not a, nice life's not a destination it's a journey but it's true because you know I, I have a very and it's it, people it's not a negative view but I, it's just an honest viewpoint is life is life is short and then you die and that's that's the reality of it and even if even if you live to be a hundred your life is not even a blink in the history of the world so in that short life you have how do you want to live it do you do you want to be negative and, and um, 
uh, self-centered and, and small-minded, or do you really say, look, I've got X amount of years on this on this planet. I don't know how many they are because I'm not in control of that. So what's the best life I can lead for me and the people around me? So that, you know, and people say, oh, you know, what legacy do you leave? I'm not sure that's for other people to, to measure. But it's, how, you know, how good can your life be for you and other people around you while you're here? And I think it, um, there's a whole lot of things about happiness and we, we won't have time for that, but there's a whole lot of measurements of happiness and one of them isn't money. It's about health first. It is about wealth, a certain amount of wealth, but over a certain time. But it's about relationships. It's about reviewing. It's about meditation and, and, and in any way, shape or form, not not mystical meditation, just time out. There's a whole lot of things that um, uh, make for a better life and I'm, I'm still learning them, I'm still doing it and I'm still enjoying them. Mm, wow, that's so true. It's not about... It's not about just the legacy that you leave because that's someone else to decide. And and often we talk about, yes, yes, we've only got one life. We don't know where we're going. And we we focus on giving people advice around um, the important work things that they should be doing. But you're right. It's also it's about enjoying life for you. So it is about relationships and health and well-being and fun and all that kind of thing. And you use that word around sustainability. And when I introduced you in the beginning, I talked about that you're the walking, talking version of sustainability. So that's key as well and really interesting. Yes, it is about the long haul and being sustainable. It's not just about fly-by-night stuff with whatever you do. That's fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. the other key thing here, Wendy, too, is, um, as Simon just said, it, it's, it's about the journey. It's not about the destination because the journey is full of all sorts of destinations as you go. And I think a lot of people get lost with, with that, uh, that item. They, they, they just see... Success is this pinnacle end point that they've got to try and get to, and they forget to enjoy everything else in between, and and, and everything that goes towards creating that success. Mm -hmm. um, so look, Simon, we we've got to wind up in in a few minutes, but my my final question to you is, um, what what um, golden nugget uh, can you impart with today for our audience? Something that they can take away from this this uh, this session yeah. from you today. I'm not sure if there's that many gold nuggets, but I, I think someone, someone said to me a long time ago, um, uh, be, be, be good to the people on the way up because you'll meet them on the way down. And I think that's very important. And, and uh, I was a very good football, and I don't say that because I say the people who told me I was a very good football, but that doesn't change doesn't change me. That doesn't make me a better or worse person than anybody else. It just made me a good footballer. And I think if you, if you show respect to everybody in your dealings with them, whether they're, uh, and that's one of the great things about playing league football. You meet the you meet the movie star. You meet the, you know, uh, I've shaken hands with Sylvester Stallone. I've met the little kid in the wheelchair in the outer. You you you, you meet a whole range of people right along across it. And the, you know, fact is that you treat them all with the, treat them all with respect because um, uh, you'd you'd hope for, hope that they would do that to you. Mm, mm, yeah, somebody said something recently around you can tell a lot, a lot about a person by how they treat the waitress or the waiter. That's so true. Yeah, and I like that. Um, yeah, treat people nicely because you'll see them on the way down as well. Mm. Or that, what is it? Was it Steve Jobs? No, not Steve Jobs, the other one, Bill Gates, that said be nice to the nerd in the classroom too because you'll be working for him one day. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> you never know when karma's going to come back to bite you. So. <laughs> That's a really, um, yeah, I like that. That's a lovely live tip for all of us. Very sobering, very heart-centred, and that's a great one to end on. So I'm going to wind up now. Thank you so much, Simon, for being our inspiring guest on Inspire Talk, Game Changers on Radio. Lots of tidbits in there for our viewers today, um, those watching live and those watching the replay. Thanks, Stuart, for being in the co-pilot seat with me. Thank you to the dogs for the light entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I'm um, signing off. And let's why don't we go out on a high and um, let's just sum up our broadcast by coming up with one word that you'd like to leave the viewers on. My word is sustainability. That really resonated for me today. Stuart, do you have one word to sum up? I think um, one of the big ones I've got, I've got from this today is find your why. I think that's very, very important for everything. That's great, Stuart. He said that was three words. Find your why. But that's okay. <laughs> and yeah. Simon, one one powerful word, or you can use two or three if you must. That's for, me it's, for me it's always for me it's always about clarity. You get rid there's this there's, there's so much there's so much uh, there can be so much fuzziness, so much uh, a noise in the world out there. It's and, and uh, different people find it different ways, but in the end if you can get your clarity, uh, it's a really good place to start. 
clarity, fantastic. Thank you, perfect, powerful word to end on. Thanks, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you.